So, therefore, you have now on your screen uh, the three icons. We are Orthodox Russian icons. And uh, these are the events of the so-called Pascal people. In the next slide, we shall see that uh, what we are doing are symbols. We're doing the symbols of the Paschal Fidel. And therefore, uh, yesterday we talked about <clears throat> the olive oil used for chrism that is used for, you could say, four sacraments. When we are baptized, we are anointed with chrism. When we are confirmed, Chrism is again given to us for the priests when they are ordained who are consecrated with chrism. And finally, the anointing of the sick. The sick is offered also chrism. More than just the oil, for us, chrism is the presence of the spirit. And then in the evening, the afternoon, we talked about the bread and the wine is in the Eucharist. So we had five sacraments yesterday. We spoke about the use of the chrism in four, and the use of the bread and wine for the Eucharistic uh, celebration, the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Let us therefore place ourselves now in God's presence and allow His Spirit to dwell in us or rather to be aware of the dwelling of the Spirit in us, being the temple of the Spirit, and let us seek, desire, what we wish God could give to us on this most holy day of His Son's passion and death for us all. Father, Father, we would like to be grateful for the gift of your only begotten Son, particularly in showing us your love unto death. May this memorial of his passion and death in Good Friday make us more appreciative of your many other invitations. We love you because by believing your son, we will not perish, but rather have eternal life. May these days uh, living out of the desires of your heart for us make each one of us more loving, more caring each other in the homes and above all more concerned especially to those who are in need and in our time those who are sick all this we ask from you in Jesus name our lady of sorrows pray for us Let's go to the third slide, and you will find thorns. Can you imagine this is not a simple magnification of a bogambilia? This is a real uh, thorn found on a tree. And uh, in the screen, probably you, I can say, or I had a personal experience of this when I was in Jerusalem for 10 months, the thorns are that long as you find in the screen. That's the length 
of the drawing. We're talking about this because you can see now the tree in the next slide. Uh, this was probably the tree where the branches were taken and uh, made into a crown of thorns for Jesus Christ. This tree was quite common in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. However, it got extinct with the expansion of the city. And of course, they don't have any, they don't have any, um, They don't have any need of this tree or whatever use it is. And so uh, they, they probably took them all away. And we had to go for a two hour trip to the desert in order to uh, find the tree. And because of this, uh, this is a picture that you can find course in the Google, but I have in my files similar pictures of the tree. In the next slide, we, now, we shall now see where they are coming from, the origin and the character of the thorns. They are now called Spina Christi, more popularly known the Uyube tree. Another tree called crown of thorns or more about a plant a thorny plant is found in madagascar and it got the name of crown of thorns because of uh, its uh, its quality or its characteristics you know? it is found in many houses grown because of warm climate is a shrub and it got that common name of the horny crown of Jesus. Because aside from the, uh, the thorns, there are red bracts of flower on it. So there is such a thing. So when I read before you now that in the Gospel of Mark, Pilate had Jesus scourged before being crucified. Mark chapter 15. The soldiers did not only scourge him, but they twisted some thorns into a crown and they put it on him. So, in the next slide, I'd like to impress upon you a true crown of a king. When you say a king's crown, well, that's one of them with the purple um, velvet, velvety material. But you can imagine all the diamonds and all the stones around the cap. That's a crown fit for a royalty, for a king. For his coronation and yet the king of kings in the next slide received this crown this is the kind of crown that they may have twisted to place on the head of jesus and why why did they place this crown because they started to taunt him they wanted to play with him make fun of him. The next slide will make it even more uh, graphic, the crown of thorns. They wanted to play with him, make fun of him. Because upon being crowned with this crown of thorns, they started saluting him, somehow bending their heads and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Oh, definitely. They're not talking about king of Rome or the emperor of Rome. They would not dare say that. 
but they were always taunting the Jews, being Roman soldiers. They taunted the Jews as a weak people because they were able to conquer them. And here is a king of the weak people that are the Jews. And the weakness of Jesus, and you could play with, they could play with him, putting a crowd and then saluting. They struck his head with a reed, spat on him. They went down on their knees to do their homage. That's what we find in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 16 to 20. Let's consider that for a while. And uh, think about the many thorny situations we got into. Probably not physical, but uh, definitely painful. And we could say with the Lord, we understand what we went through. The times we were insulted, the times people made fun of us, we call them today bullying. Um, there happened many times, I think, especially when we were boys, small kids in the midst of an uh, all-boys school with the uh, big high school guys, and they would uh, make fun of their younger companions in school. So those experiences could have been traumatic for some. And in fact, um, they could be uh, resulting into what happened in the States as massacre uh, in a school system. A young man like 14, 15 would uh, premeditatively prepare himself and plan how he would shoot his companions in school. The next slide talks about purple rope. I don't know if you have seen the movie Color Purple, but I realized that purple is a very important color. Why? Why was Jesus given a purple rope? In the same Gospel of Mark, it says, they dressed him up in purple. Matthew says, they gave him a scarlet robe. That's why there's a movie called The Scarlet Robe. But Mark and John, John says, they gave him a robe, a cloak, colored purple. And so it is also in that same instance when Pilate allowed the Roman soldiers to scourge Jesus, to play with him. And uh, this is in chapter 19, verse 5 to 6. Uh, oh, sorry, verses 1. To three. The soldiers twisted some horns into a crown, put it on his head, and dressed him in a purple robe. <coughs> Let's look at the meaning of purple. The next slide tells us the significance of purple. It's a dye, but it's a very costly dye. So you have a cloth, white cloth, then you dye it exceedingly expensive because it is also time consuming. And because of the high cost of the dye to make fabric purple, it was normally the rich who could buy one. And it was reserved also for the kings, for the royals. Look at the next slide. In the movie of Cleopatra, Elizabeth Taylor wears a purple dress. 
fit for the queen, fit for the queen of Egypt. So, is that all? Well, in the next slide, you can see who are the royalties of today. And you could find out what's her name again? The wife of Prince William and the mother, the grandmother, Queen Elizabeth II. They wear purple. Regal color, as they call it. It's, uh, even today, it is uh, significant to the knowledge of the royalty that when they wear purple, they are wearing very expensive clothes. In the next slide, the dye, where does the dye come from? A Tyrrhenian mollusk. A shell color purple it's very small that is probably probably on the screen a magnification of times 50 even 70 of that uh, tyrrhenian mollusk and what is this tyrrhenian mollusk in the next slide it is coming from tyre a trading city of the Phoenicians in the modern day Lebanon. Uh, these fabric traders obtained the dye from a small mollusk that we just saw that was only found in the entire region of the Mediterranean Sea. So we said a lot of work has to be done, and you needed 9,000 of those little, little mollusk shells to create just one gram of purple dye. So only wealthy rulers could afford to buy and wear the color. It became associated with the imperial classes of Rome, Egypt, and Persia. However, purple also began to represent spirituality and holiness. Why? Because the ancient emperors, especially of Rome, were thought to be gods, or at least descendants from the gods. The Greek uh, mythologies. So, royalty, kings, emperors, they started to link the color purple even to God, and therefore to spirituality and holiness. That's our connect. In the next slide, you will find out now that the high priest that is going to be presenting himself once a year, only one person, the high priest could go in front of the Ark of the Covenant. You see there are two angels huh, that are adoring what is inside the Ark of the covenant which is of course the covenant stones coming from moses manna in the desert and the staff of moses are found inside that ark and uh, they place incense on top they call that the seat of mercy in between the two angels is the seat of mercy look at the color of the high priest's robe with 12 big stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Even inside that robe is, I mean, inside that vest is a purple with white over it and then purple again inside, more inside. So purple became a priestly color as well. The next slide, Exodus 21, 31 to 34, explicitly states the robe of the ephod, what is now found in front in the right side uh, panel, 
you shall make entirely of violet material. It shall have an opening for the head in the center and around this opening there shall be a salvage woven as an opening of the shirts to keep it from being torn. On the hem of that uh, robe at the bottom you shall make pomegranates so you see the pomegranates the purple strings strands that are circular and tied below and uh, woven of violet purple scarlet yarn and finally then twined with gold bells between them what is the bell for huh? in between pomegranate our bell is a bell so that when the high priest goes to the holy of holies people would hear him moving and the bells will tell them tell the people that he is representing them before the presence of god in the ark of the covenant do you remember how come bells are being uh, sounded when the priest raises the consecrated host and the consecrated wine and before communion to remind us it's time to come forward for communion a bell is still being rung so we have a connection with the religious rituals of the jewish of judaism of the jewish faith and we use purple in the lenten season as well as in the Advent season. It's not just a color. Well, we use it also for the masses for the dead. It's a use, they say, always of expectation, of awaiting before you could wear a brighter color like yellow, I mean, or gold or white. But no, uh, now I understand that this is a very priestly color the one of purple. The next slide you will see the Jewish high priest elegantly wearing the purple gown with his prayer shawl and uh, a scroll, part of the scriptures written in uh, parchments. So when Jesus, in the next slide, was tried by Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest, he was wearing also as a former high priest, purple. So Mel Gibson did well in putting this. And including his son-in-law, when Jesus would be sent by Annas to Caiaphas in the next slide, Caiaphas is also wearing purple. More purple than his father-in-law. That's the next slide. Indicating this to us, let us therefore go where we are moving into. The next slide repeats to us what is found in the Gospel of John. This is John chapter 19, verses 1 up to 3. Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And beyond the scourging, the soldiers wove a crown out of him and then placed it on his head and then clothed him in a purple cloak. They came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him. They slapped him in the face repeatedly. That's the King of Kings. That's the King 
of the Jews. But then you can imagine what insult the Son of God received in the morning of the first Good Friday. That's why I'd like to share with you almost in real time in the time of Jesus that it was at this moment that he was uh, judged by Pilate at around 9 in the morning and this taunting and uh, repeated flogging of Jesus happened for about an hour before they led him to Calvary where at 12 noon it is very much said in the Gospel of John, it was noon of the day of preparation. When this uh, event would proceed towards Calvary. So what could be the effect of wearing this purple robe on Jesus. The next slide says, the Romans must have known the, ro the royal significance of the color purple. And so in the next slide it says, which explains why they mockingly put a purple robe on Jesus. And then the Romans did it on purpose also for making it ironic to the Jews who were who requested him to be crucified and yet making fun of him they called him hail king of the Jews in the next slide that's what we find as a text what the Romans probably didn't know and now we would also would like to discover that God in the Old Testament commanded Israel through Moses to make the tabernacle, no? the Ark of the Covenant, closed with ten curtains of fine twined linen, blue and purple and scarlet lines. So there is already the purple, but blue and scarlet, red, twined together. That's what we saw underneath the robe of the high priest. Blue, purple, and scarlet lines. <coughs> it would be the veil that would cover the Holy of Holies from the very top, from the very ceiling down to the floor. Ten of those uh, huge curtains that will cover the presence of God from the sight of the people. And only one person every year can enter in that gloomy, dark area to offer incense. So in the next slide, we complete what God has said in the uh, in his uh, uh, in his te text, I mean, in the in what he said to Moses, they are to make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen embroidered with needlework. So therefore, purple was so prevalent in the temple because God wanted Israel to recognize that the greatest royalty of all is really God himself. And for this, the temple displayed purple in multiple places to remind them of the fact that God is the sovereign king of the universe. So just imagine seeing the color purple on Jesus. It really made the high priests, the Pharisees, and all those who are in the religious leadership uh, somehow angry 
about the irony of that symbolism. So the next slide would tell us, this would be the veil of the temple that will be used by Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, five. Katapetasma. Katapetasma. A technical term that in Greek, in the Septuagint of the Old Testament, is used for three different hangings in the tabernacle and the temple. However, Matthew's statement is not veils, but veil of the temple suggesting only one hanging that could be in the view, the inner veil, therefore, much, much inner than what other veils would be. It was to be hung before the Holy of Holies, before the tabernacle or the so-called Ark of the Covenant. It has to be perfect of a cube of three cubic of 10 cubits per side. The veil was hung by gold hooks on an acacia wooden frame, which itself was overlaid with gold and the art and the art of the covenant was kept behind that veil. So God cannot be seen. Yahweh remains in his obscurity to maintain the so-called mystery of the living God. It is this that is placed a veil to conceal him from the sight of people. Because to see God, you will means to die. So what happened? In the afternoon of Good Friday, the next slide will show, that this veil that hangs in the inner sanctum of the temple before the Holy of Holies will be torn into. And what will come out is the so called kabod. Kabod means glory. Glory of God is a shining shaft of light of the sun against a very cloudy mountain. And in spite of that very dense cloud, it cannot conquer the light. And that is called glory. When we say glory be to the Father, we're talking about this uh, shaft of light that pierces a cloudy mountain top. And you could see somehow the mountain top because a shaft of light pierces the cloud. And so in chapter, it says there, Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, and suddenly the veil of the sanctuary was torn into two from top to bottom. Look at the picture. And then the earthquake, the rocks were split, the tombs opened. This is the moment when Jesus expired. Verse 50 says, Jesus crying out loud, yielded up his spirit. Glory, manifestation of who God is. Seeing God is now seeing him in his son on the cross. That's the glory. And that's what Jesus called the hour. In John chapter 2, after he has made the miracle his first sign his first miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. you have in chapter 2 verse 11 having made 
what uh, wine out of water this was the first sign of jesus it was at cana in galilee he revealed his glory his power his might but how did he reveal that glory out of service no? for a couple that would put up with a great embarrassment because they were not able to calculate the number of guests against the volume of wine that they would take in for the wedding for the wedding feast so that uh, sign is just projectual towards the real glorification of God, of Christ, rather. Because in chapter 17 of John's Gospel, we will find that uh, he would say on verse 5, Now, Father, glorify me. With that glory I had with you before ever the world existed. How is that glory to be glorified? To be manifested, glorified? It is this. When Jesus dies uh, and the veil of the temple symbolic of now seeing who is the true God, Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 39 says, when the centurion experienced that the veil of the sanctuary was torn into two, the centurion standing in front of Jesus, as he has seen him, how he died, said, in truth, this man was son of God. Nakita ko na rin kung sino ang Diyos. Ito ang Diyos. Narito ako sa harap ng Panginoon. A Gentile. An unbeliever. In that sense of uh, Judaism. The faith of the Jews. And yet was able to manifest. To verbalize from his experience. The glory of God. What is the glory of God? Jesus raised up on the cross. Greater love than this. No man has. That is God's glory. No one can possess any higher love than the love of God. And that is to behold the glory of God. So, let us go to what I quoted. In the next slide, Matthew chapter 15. Sorry, that is no, sorry, the Gospel of Matthew, that is chapter 27. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the veil of the sanctuary was torn into two. How do we apply this? How do we apply this to ourselves? And we have here the next slide. A letter of St. Peter to the presbyters. Diba? Color purple are for the priestly class in uh, Judaism. And now he speaks to the presbyters, to the leaders of the community. And saying in his letter to the presbyters, I exhort you as a fellow presbyter and witness of the sufferings of Christ and one who has a share in the glory to be revealed. See the glory with the halo between glory and God, the two words. Then the flock of God in your midst Overseeing them not by constraint, but willingly, as God would have it. Not for shameful profit, but eagerly. Do not lord it over those assigned to you. 
but be examples to the flock. So that when the chief shepherd is revealed, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. It is said to the leaders of the community, they are not priests, huh? they are administrators. They were placed as uh, the one to take care of the follow-up of what the apostles have done with their preaching and therefore baptized people. They left presbyters, leaders among them, like Titus or Timothy for the communities of Paul. So there are many of these persons left behind by Peter and Paul particularly, and he's speaking about how these leaders should behave for the sake of their flock or their subjects. Treat them as God treated you. Treat them the way Christ treated us through his suffering. Though he is the king, he suffered for us. So brothers and sisters, this is the way to glory. While we speak about the symbols of the crown, but it's made of thorns and a purple robe that is fitting for a royalty and a priestly class, Jesus was placed with his symbols, though taunted, but actually they are real. I mean, it's, it befits his person as king. Of course, it should have been a real royal crown and it should be a real well-vested robe. But no, in spite of the taunting, still the glory of God is shown. Because it's not in the dress, it's not in the crown. It is in the attitude, it is in the behavior that God is king, that God's glory shines. And the behavior is one of service, not done by constraint, but willingly. It's a kind of service, not because of profit, but done eagerly, never lording it over, but rather like a shepherd, servant, even to the point of suffering. So let's go to the conclusion of our morning reflection. There is a song in the next slide where it states, O sacred head surrounded. Let us just pray the verses. There are three sets of verses, three stanzas. This will be our prayer at the end of our reflection. Altogether, O sacred head surrounded by crown of piercing thorn. O bleeding head so wounded, so shamed and put to scorn. Death's pallid hue comes o'er thee. The glow of life decays, yet angel hosts adore thee. They tremble as they gaze. Thy comeliness and vigor is withered up and gone. And in thy wasted figure, I see death grow on. O agony and dying, O love to sinners free. Jesus, all grace supplying, turn thou thy face on me. In this, thy bitter passion, good shepherd, think of me with thy most sweet compassion, unworthy though I be. Beneath thy cross abiding, forever would I rest in thy dear love confiding and with thy presence blessed. May the love of God in its fullness become a felt love in our hearts today 
so that we would know who really we are. We are all beloved of the King of the universe. Our Lady of Sorrows, pray for us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.